In the magical universe, it's an assumption that the prime materium is bound by structure and loosed by entropy. Law and chaos are at times equal, at other times the world is unchanging or roiling. From a deterministic outlook, the location and state of that materium is based on what came before. A rule of consequence and causation that relies upon there being no supernatural force to basically throw an arcane spanner into the works. But magic permeates everywhere, doing impossible things to the environment, and there appears to be no control to it, no underlying rule set beyond what sentience has applied in order to make fit magic work. Once upon a time there was a magus of the Conclave of Silverymoon who decided to bring the theories and study of magic to the wider population, teaching first of all the theory of Akasa. We've all heard this mage speak again and again on the subject, so I won't go into detail, but at one point in his lectures we heard him talk about creating a concentrated bead of fire that would then fly down a projective path and explode when it hit a material object. What he didn't really go into at the time was having it explode at a predetermined point, without hitting anything, merely basing that desire on the intent of the spell, a subtle part of the weave that is written on the fly with a sort of XYZ coordinate from the perspective of the caster. But what if there was more than one foundational energy, one that didn't so much shape reality as one that informed where and how reality could potentially be shaped? An energy that if it didn't exist, would mean that you wouldn't have the option to begin with, to twine an XYZ coordinate into your spells. And indeed, there'd be no bead travelling down the line, nothing to say the diameter of the fire, how much damage it did, there would be no potential. There would just be. In the past, we've dealt with time manipulation magic and the power to invoke fate and destiny in an effort to better understand what has come before, in order to better comprehend the new magic outlined in Explorer's Guide to Wildermount, sorry, Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, written by Matthew Mercer, James Hayek, James Intracasso, and Chris Lockie, among others. But perhaps at the time I misunderstood what the magic was trying to teach. At the time I assumed it would be the manipulation of a caster into a tradition that affected the overworld. Time travel in the old sense manipulated a time stream and chronergic plane that was apart from the world and connected to it from somewhere out there to somewhere in here. But Dynamis is the magic of the underpinnings of the material world. And I quote, Dynamis is the primal magical energy of potentiality and actuality, an anticipatory arcane force that helps shape the multiverse and might very well be what holds its elements together like an infinite web of unseen tethers. Why does the fireball spell explode here and not there? Dunamis. Why do I stand at point A and not point B right now? Dunamis. Why does the reverse gravity spell work within a set cylinder, and what determines the effects of hitting the top of that cylinder? Dunamis. Why do we have choice, and why can we utilize magic that informs the best choice we can make? Why can we have augury or foresight or other spells that prove we don't live in a deterministic material world, and that free will must actually and definitively exist? Dunamis? Dunamis manifests as a great energy as ethereal as mist, which proves its existence as readily as spellfire proves the existence of a casa. It darkens as it crosses the moment of action or invocation, as what could be becomes what is, and instead holds the consequences of those actions. In 5th edition we don't have many abilities to travel back in time longer than a round, and it's very difficult to change the past. As Dynamis is now a tether, it could be considered an ethereal mist in the future, a fluid of possibility in the present, but an immutable solid in the past once it's had a chance to set. Sorry, the metaphor may have run away with me a bit, but it's just so exciting to be a spellcaster in this new age of quantum energy. Those who study the powers and limitations of Dunamis are known as Dunamancers, and for some worlds the practice is especially old. In the newly discovered Sphere of Exandria, the ancient Kryn dynasty have spent considerable effort in developing and refining Dunamancy. However, the continent of Wildmount is in a constant state of war, and we all know how quickly a secret can spread in times of civil unrest, twice as fast as a rumour, and three times more deadly. We have gained a considerable number of spells in Azotera on the subject. We know that Dunamancers both manipulate Dunamis itself and the laws of time, potential, and gravity. 
Again, I quote, Those who study to control and tap into this near invisible power can subtly bend the flow of time and space by controlling the forces of localized gravity, peering into possible timelines to shift fate in their favor, and scattering the potential energy of their enemies to rob them of their potency. We're going to quickly explore some ways that Dunamancy has manifested in practitioners, lightly touching on the Echo Knight and the casters of time and gravity, chronergist and graviturgist respectively. I think it would be a disservice to anyone yet to fully research this new resource if I went into exacting detail of statistics and abilities. I don't want to ruin the surprise as it were, and regardless this is a lesson in magical theory, not practicality. Dunamis, as we've mentioned before, extends not just into the physical concepts of time and gravity, but also into the nebulous what-ifs of potential and choice. Every moment possesses an opportunity for you and I to follow paths of differing consequences. The reality of each choice coalesces as we approach the moment of decision and is so seamless that you would be forgiven for thinking it is the only action you could have made, and in fact there were no other possible paths. It's how most of us live our lives, and unknown to us an entire lifetime of potential choices and consequences fade, and the dynamis tethers of that road not taken diffuse back into the universe. But some dunamances have learned to both invoke and harness that other lifetime, use it to enhance their martial abilities. These martial dunamances have the advantage of knowing that every choice is conscious, and separates their fate between continuing on or their adventure ending right there on the battlefield. They have the focus needed to not only sense the dunamis, but also use it to their advantage, manifesting themselves from a failed timeline, a shadow of what and who they very nearly were, an alternate version from a dead and divergent timeline, an echo. Echo Knights seem to manifest the same structures, suggesting either a limitation to how dunamis can be expressed in this way, or perhaps the limitations of how the technique is taught to others. An Echo Knight manifests a great image of themselves within 15 feet. No further than that, as the moment is too distant, literally an entire two or three universes away. But once the connection is made steady by both Dynamis and the Tether the Casa, these Echoes can attack on behalf of the Knight, can act as the eyes and ears, and as the vessel is a near perfect copy of the original knight's own body and solstice, their consciousness can even flit between the two. With proficiency and practice, the Echo Knight may even eventually create more than one Echo at a time, though this has only happened a couple of times and even then has been recorded only anecdotally and in songs. With more traditional magics, Dunamancy as a study of the tethering magic of everything is not itself a school of magic, but rather a new way to create specialized schools. Chronergy is the study of time made possible by Dunamis, and allows mages to learn new spells but also manipulate the flow and ebb of time around themselves and others. Chronergists begin by being able to see the moments between choice, much like an Echo Knight, but change the initial choice both for themselves and others. Time, however, likes to progress as was originally chosen. The preceding universe has a much greater momentum than the Echo of a single person and the dynamist tethers started to already solidify, so that change is not guaranteed, but rather the person might feel an advantage or disadvantage in completing their chosen task. As the universes compete, one could imagine there being a greater release of dynamis as the near-solid tethers are wiped. Over time, that familiarity increases, giving both a personal speed to become inherent in times of danger, and even in turning the magic of a spell, the effects and everything already encoded, cast and manifest it, and give it to another person, and that person can activate the bead from their location. Again, the tethers of Dunamis seemingly work without regard to distance given the original cast and the effect, and seem to ignore that causal universe, possibly because it informs the causal universe. Graviturgists work with the other side of the same coin, mastering the forces that both bind and abjure material bodies. Gravity is a violent force and terrible law, and the Graviturgists walk that line between chaos and order to their benefit, and the terrible detriment of those who stand in their way. As Dunamis gives the material world and her objects a definition for their qualities, Graviturgists can manipulate the weight of others using that Dunamis, halving or doubling the weight but keeping their structural integrity and strength. Objects include people in this, 
and with a reduced field for gravity this means that people are able to jump higher and move faster, or gain the advantage of heavier mass and strength if their weight is doubled. From there the manipulation of gravity becomes more fine-tuned, from being able to open a gravity well next to a creature affected by their magic, to being able to increase the velocity of both falling creatures and even of swung weapons against foes. Gravity is such an immense, ever-present force, so it is astonishing that manipulation of Dunamis can be made so small or so fleeting. There is not much time between a sword being swung and hitting a target, and being able to pinpoint that in the chaos of battle, manipulate it, and then end that manipulation implies that the Graviturgist feels the movement and tethering of every object in their vicinity. With spells, we have a record of some of them that are used in Exandria, though our mages here in Silvery Moon haven't been able to cast them yet, as they require some understanding of Dunamis itself. Rest assured, however, we have our best minds on the subject to recreate a casting in the future. So for now, we'll look at three spells as written in the Mapha Magica and Theorem to give an understanding of the type of magic that is possible. As of this lecture, the spells are written for arcane mages, specifically wizards, but there's no reason why a sorcerer can't reproduce these, or a warlock patron might know of this esoterra also. And while the clerics assure me that no such portfolio exists for Potentia, the gods may take this new knowledge and lay claim to it in no time. The first spell focuses on potentiality, apparently called with a gas of fortune's favor. This spell takes from the potential timelines and potential choices to give the caster, or a target the caster chooses, the ability to draw from that and gain an advantage on something that they're trying to accomplish, be it hitting the monster or trying to avoid the worst effects of that poison mist. The spell makes me wonder if Dunamis carries and keeps information from divergent timelines that were never meant to be. If the energy they speak of is tethers that attach to matter in a reality where the choice was made successfully. I think it makes a better sense if that's the case, that Dunamances take this grey potential energy that has coalesced into a future in Potentia, and basically use it to drag their reality from one river of time to another river. The second spell focuses on time. Wither, uh, Wither guests? Temporal shunt? Huh. The spell targets a creature and that creature vanishes, reappearing in a future instance in the same location or the nearest one if that's become occupied. Magical theory would suggest that there was a danger of losing the subject if they were placed in a divergent timeline as we passed into another, but the efficacy of the spell would suggest this is not the case. The spell therefore places a spotlight on the idea that matter can't easily be destroyed entirely. Yes, I understand there's such a thing as the disintegrate spell, but there matter is just changed. We see it with the Echo Knight and again with the spell, regardless of the moment that eventually passes, the target comes back. It exists in all future moments, there is no divergence for the creature, only for time. It's like there are, and this is going to sound very theoretical, it's like there are infinite positions in any moment of time, but the target occupies a true overarching position, a super position, but that super position is only supposition. The final spell focuses on gravity. Wither gas. Okay, okay, can I see the spell book that you're getting these from? Yeah, thought so. Wither gas fireball, wither gas message, wither gas family bar, but you know what? Let's just call the spell what it was probably actually called Dark Star. This spell creates a sphere at the point in space that causes crushing gravity. It makes all terrain difficult to walk through, eradicates light and other such non-magical energy so that even natural dark vision doesn't work through it, and any creature within it takes a dragon's breath worth of damage, and this damage is cyclical within the standard refresh rate for a spell. Dunamis may work easily with tiny moments and small movements, but on the other side of this it can be devastating. One should not dismiss Dunamances as only people who work behind small scenes, but people who can in order to achieve their own vision for a better future, and who don't mind resorting to the same destructive forces as other mages. Be kind to the people who practice Dunamancy, for they bring with them the ability to change the world without any of us even knowing it. And now that this knowledge is being disseminated to the other prime material worlds, 
The web of interconnectivity means that all of our fates are now that just that little bit closer. Thank you for listening to this magical theory lecture. I hope everyone is doing well wherever they are. Next time, we'll likely tackle something that you, the listener, wants to know about, so we'll keep things fluid, as they might say as a Dunamatsa. And, until then, to be continued.